From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week, where the discussion today is going to be all about the Lincoln Motor Company. And that's because we've got the president of the Lincoln Motor Company, Kumar Gaholtra. And Kumar, thanks so much for coming on AutoLine this week. Thank you for having me, John. Great to be here. Also joining us today, Alisa Priddle from the Detroit Free Press and Keith Naughton from Bloomberg. Great having the both of you here, too. Thank you. Kumar, let's start out talking, and I know we're going to go all over the world with this Lincoln story, but let's okay. start in the U.S. Year to date, your sales are good. You're growing twice as fast as the rest of the market, mm -hmm. but it's coming down to two vehicles that are hauling the weight, the, the new Navigator and uh, the MKC. The others are down. Can you do anything to turn them around, or is it just time to have them replaced as the new ones come out and turn it around that way? So, John, um, when we launched the MKZ in 2013, we had made a plan to introduce four all-new vehicles in four years. So, as Z was the, obviously the first one, doing very well in its segment. Then came the C that you mentioned, is doing very, very well. Uh, we're just launching the MKX, so we're, we're in the sellout of the old MKX. The all-new 2016 MKX is just reaching the dealerships. <clears throat> and in the middle, we also uh, refreshed uh, the Navigator, which, as you mentioned, is doing fantastic. Year over year, every month since we launched it is up 80 percent, 90 percent. Uh, and then the last and the, of the four is the Continental, which we've shown it, shown the concept, the production vehicle comes out. Uh, next year. So on that plan of Z, C, X, and Continental, we're right on track, uh, and the Navigator is doing quite well. So as you mentioned, we, we um, grew, outgrew the industry 2 to 1 in 2014. And the industry grew, luxury industry grew in 2014 about 8 percent. We grew 16 percent. This year, so far, we're up 8 percent, and that is before the, the volume of the new MKX really reaches uh, the dealerships. So we're, we're quite uh, optimistic about this year and the next year with the Continental. Well, I mean, as you look at the luxury segment, um, sure. do you see that it's going to, uh, how much growth do you see both in the U.S. and China, where it's an equally important market for you? Where do you see that segment going and how do you see your sales within that? looking forward. So let's start with uh, the U.S. Uh, like I said, we had a really good 14. We outpaced the industry. We're having a very good 15. Uh, in 16, uh, we believe uh, with the launch of the Continental, uh, we will again outpace the industry. Uh, we expect the industry to be more or less uh, even in the, uh, the luxury segment to be even in the United States. In China, we expect the luxury segment next year to grow. So there's been a lot of news about slowdown. It just won't go grow as fast as a lot of us were expecting. We were expecting, you know, nine, 10 plus percent growth, but now we think it will be more like three to four percent growth, but it's still substantial growth. And the absolute size of the Chinese market, it's still uh, a very big market. Uh, we now have uh, 20 stores in China. Uh, we s opened our first store uh, November of last year, so only about 11 months ago. Uh, and in those 11 months, we've opened 20 stores, and they're all performing better than we had expected. So the brand's been received very, very well in China. By the end of this year, we, that store count will go up from 20 to 25. Uh, next year, we will finish the year at 60 stores. So that, that growth continues, uh, both in our network uh, and in our volumes. So uh, again, very optimistic about China as well. You know, Kumar, you have these great global ambitions, and <clears throat> China's a big centerpiece, but one of your hottest models is the Navigator, a big truck-based SUV which is going gangbusters, just like the Escalade is for Cadillac. I wonder if you've had an evolution of thought on that model and what role it plays in your portfolio, and if you just have an idea of why Americans seem to love very large luxury SUVs. Well, it, it delivers what the consumers need to meet their uh, meet their day-to-day -day activities. Um, it, and we're introducing in China, by the way, as well, uh, sometime in November, December this year. Um, it is doing very well, uh, but we're working on a total portfolio. As I mentioned, the Z is doing very well in its segment, and we now have a great uh, lineup of SUVs with the C and the X uh, and the Navigator. Uh, in terms of why it does so well in the U.S., we pay a lot of attention to our customers' needs. 
Uh, we study their needs, we try to understand their needs constantly. And then we try to, to the best of our ability, to actually provide technologies and space and, and vehicles that meet those needs. And that process itself, I think, is very critical in the success of these vehicles. Do you think Americans still equate large with luxury? I don't believe so, because uh, uh, MKC is a compact SUV and is doing very, very well. So it comes down to what your personal needs are. There are, there are smaller families, for example, the MKX. Uh, the average age uh, for the, the previous MKX was you know, in mid-50s. For the new MKX, we're expecting it to be in the mid to late 40s. Uh, couples, empty nesters, or some with one or two kids at home. Uh, for their needs, that vehicle is perfect. But if there's a larger family where parents are hauling around sports equipment, hockey equipment, soccer equipment, whatever it might be, and a bigger family, uh, then you need a bigger vehicle, and then uh, the end navigator fits that bill very, very so well. So does the Continental customer also cross over with the Navigator customer? Does that appeal to the same uh, customer? It appeals to a similar demographic, but it would be a different need. So if you have a large family and you have to, to haul around all that sports equipment uh, or you need a third row seat, then the Continental is not the vehicle for you, uh, and Navigator is. But Continental is going to be our, our flagship sedan with you know a great presence on the road, and, and, and it's a beautiful car. Now, part of the appeal of the Navigator, of course, is low gas prices right now. No one expects that that will be the case forever. Um, so are you worried about that or do you think that by having a next generation one and, and having um, heavier use of aluminum counteracts that makes it fuel efficient enough that you hedge against um, a scenario of those sales dropping? Yeah, we are always, always uh, trying to improve the fuel economy uh, of all of our, our vehicles. Uh, and ju just the, uh, the navigator that we're talking about that's in the marketplace today, uh, we launched it with the, uh, the EcoBoost engine, the twin turbo, and it's got great, it's great combination of power and fuel economy. And we're going to continue to build on that and other technologies for, for the future uh, navigators that we launch. And aluminum will play a big part of that as well? Well, we're not discussing specifics on the technologies of uh, the future products, but we, we will use the combination of technologies that delivers both the spaciousness that that customer is looking for and a very fuel efficient vehicle. I'd like to go back to China for the moment. Yes. We, we keep hearing that Lincoln's doing well there, but we never see any real sales numbers. Can you share any of those sales numbers yeah, with us? We, we haven't shared Lincoln-specific sales, and there's a, there's a reason for that, John. The reason is, uh, as I mentioned, we opened our very first store uh, November of last year, uh, so less than 11 months ago. And when you're growing your network, uh, the, there's always this risk of getting those numbers uh, out of context or twisted because we're competing with our, our, our we're competing with other brands who have three or four hundred stores, and we had our first one in November. And as we grow and stabilize the network, we will certainly start sharing those numbers. But on a per store uh, number, we're doing very very well. The throughput is fantastic. Uh, as a matter of fact, as of now, year to date, uh, three of the top ten dealers globally are in China, so doing very, very well. Okay, you want to end up at the end of next year with 60 dealers. Right. Where would you like to settle in at, say, over the next five years? We haven't uh, really uh, discussed plans of how much bigger do we want to be, but we're being very careful with the size of the network in China. Um, we certainly do not want to end up in a situation where we are over-dealered and we're hurting the brand where the dealers are competing with each other. So for example, in Shanghai we have two dealers right now, in Beijing we have two dealers. And we also want to experiment with some other concept where you may be able to provide the customer with a dealership experience without putting up the, the giant um, dealership at every corner of, of major cities. So. A lot of this can be done online, a lot of this can be done with other platforms, but we want to be very careful in setting up the number of dealers that's appropriate for our brand. And do you see a day where you will be building Lincolns in China? If the business case makes sense, uh, certainly. You know, we're a very, uh, all of you know, we're a very capital intensive business, uh, so the volume has to be there. Uh, right now, there are no plans to build there, but our volumes are growing, and if the 
volumes at certain point cross that threshold where the investment makes sense, uh, we would certainly consider it. And then you, um, your longer term outlook is for global sales of about 300,000 um, a year. Do, do you expect that to be kind of a, a real half and half between China and the U.S.? Or um, do you see one weighted more heavily than the other? And do you ever see Europe as being a contributor? So, yeah, we do expect it to be 300,000 plus by 2020. And the two biggest markets there will be the U.S. and China, roughly at equal volumes. It depends where, where each market goes. Uh, we, also are, uh, we also today sell in about 20 markets globally. Um, so we're in, in uh, Canada, in Mexico, in Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. South Korea. So we'll continue to grow all of those markets uh, as we grow U.S. and China as well. And eventually, yes, yeah, certainly at some point, we would seriously consider Europe, but that is not in the plans right now. At the moment, we are completely focused on growing in the U.S. and uh, growing in China. Well, and you've got Ford vehicles that, you know, the Vignali, I mean, you, you sort of filled the gap on the Ford brand side in Europe. So is there even room for Lincoln in Europe? Honestly, we're so focused on U.S. and China right now. Uh, I personally have not given a lot of thought to when we would enter Europe and how we would enter Europe. But it is one of the, the three largest markets, uh, luxury markets in the world. You know, it'll be China, US, and Europe. And uh, at some point, uh, after we're well established in US and China, um, we would certainly consider Europe. So Kumar, with, with the Continental, you've introduced a new face of Lincoln, a different right. grill that you know, was widely praised when you showed it in New York. Um, why move away from the split wing grill, which uh, is rooted in your heritage and is on the new MKX. Yeah, like you said, Keith, it is uh, rooted in our heritage and it's been a key part of our design language. Uh, but for any brand, especially an automotive brand, uh, we need to continuously evolve our design language. So we're evolving our surface language, we're getting great proportions for our vehicles, and we felt it was time to freshen the grill as well. And it was very well received. Uh, it looks great, not only on the Continental, but we've tested it on our other rest of our portfolio. So over time, we will be moving rest of the portfolio to the new grill that you, you saw on the Continental. Uh, but in the meantime, the, uh, the split wing grill, which has been part of our heritage and, and has been a key cue in our design language, will continue on, on some of our vehicles. And as you introduce the new grill, will you also introduce a new uh, nomenclature and move away from the alphanumerics? Actually, the Alpha Numerics have now have got pretty good brand equity now. The MKX, the MKZ, the, the uh, MKC. So we're going to continue with those. Uh, with the Continental, of course, we, we launched a very iconic name, uh, relaunched an iconic name. Uh, Lincoln has had some fantastic names in its history. Uh, Navigator is one of them, so obviously with Navigator we'll continue. Uh, with the Navigator name. And we've got other products in our cycle plan. And as we get closer to those launches, uh, we would seriously debate whether we, we will have an alphanumeric or, a, or a, another one of the iconic names. But no change in, no, I have nothing to announce in moving <laughs> away from MK uh, nomenclature today. So th there's no problem having a mixed portfolio, no. some alphanumeric, some names? No, we don't believe so. Uh, we, we think each car stands on its own and each name uh, has its own brand equity. So I don't see an issue with having both. What are some of the iconic names that you'd like to see come back? Well, for, for now, it's just Continental and Navigator. And uh, <laughs> if we were planning on bringing other iconic names back, it, it's not something we've discussed yet. It would be a decision made much closer to, to launching some of those products. Kumar, as you said, when uh, the Continental came out, boy, it took the New York Auto Show by storm. But as you well know, some designers at Bentley took great offense with the design of the car, claiming that it looked too much like their flying spur. In fact, one of them was very uh, active on social media. He's no longer with Bentley, by the way. <laughs> but I'm wondering, did you guys go back and for the production version make any changes that maybe toned down some of those criticisms? No, the Continental uh, was, it is an original uh, Lincoln design, and the Lincoln design team is very proud of that design. It's a very elegant car. It's got great proportions. And the v production vehicle actually is going to be very, very close to what you saw in concept. So concept was so well received, uh, the production vehicle is going to be very, very close to that concept vehicle. I can't wait for it to hit the market. Now, you've, you've changed your design leadership as well on the Lincoln side. Was that 
um, to do the Continental, or are you getting fresh blood? What was the, the thinking? No, no, I, that was a while back. That was even before I took the job when uh, David Woodhouse came on to uh, Continental, uh, to, to, for, to the Lincoln Studio. It was a normal chain of moves within our corporation and design studio, nothing to do with a specific vehicle. Okay. Kumar, I've got to believe that you're watching Cadillac very closely. Cadillac's been trying to revive the brand for, you got a big jump start on Lincoln, now Lincoln's trying to do the same thing. In my opinion, the Cadillac lineup it may be the finest cars that they've had in their lineup in the last 50 years, but it's not working. As good as the cars are, they're just not selling all that well. Are there lessons to be learned, you know, pitfalls to avoid as you look as to what you've got to do with Lincoln? So, John, we're looking at Lincoln from three key perspectives. There's the brand itself, uh, which is underpinned by products and experiences. And that's not true of just uh, the automotive brand. It's true of any brand, and especially any luxury brand. So the, the products and the experiences that you create for your customers must deliver on the brand image that you're trying to communicate or project. So let's take those three pillars brand, product, and, and the, the experiences. Um, if you do only one of those three, it doesn't work. In any industry, it doesn't work. If you do, you have great products, uh, but you haven't communicated it well enough, people don't understand the brand or, or, or are not familiar with the brand, that's an issue. Or if you provide great products, but the consumers have a terrible experience while interacting with you, uh, that's not going to work either. And if you do both of those very well, but don't communicate it well, that's not going to So all three of them have to move in parallel. And if you pay attention to all three and lift the game on all three, it kind of becomes a virtuous circle where the experiences and the, and the products then feed the brand. So we're focused on all three simultaneously. We're working on, and when I say experiences, I mean every single touch point the client has with our brand. Could be our app, could be our, our um, website, Lincoln.com our products, our dealerships, our facilities, and it has to be throughout the entire process. Uh, when they shop for the vehicle, when they buy the vehicle, and through, throughout the entire ownership period of the vehicle. So we've got a very comprehensive strategy on all three parts of that business. And, and it's starting to work. It's, uh, the proof points are there. As we mentioned, the growth is there, the products are there, and our client experience have substantially improved. In, in, in China, we, we had the opportunity to start from scratch, and that's a global benchmark now on, on the kind of experiences uh, we're providing in China. So a very comprehensive plan, and the proof points are there that it's working. Where does your research show that the brand is at the moment? If we consider that it used to be viewed as the airport shuttle brand or an old man's car, you've had all these Matthew McConaughey ads, are you skewing younger? Are you changing the perception of the brand? Where do you stand? Uh, that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the McConaughey campaign key. That's worked very, very uh, well for us. All the metrics, uh, both at an emotional level and, and at an objective metric level. Uh, at an emotional level, it's brought Lincoln into the popular culture uh, discussion. Um, at an objective, measurable level, um, you know, the, most of us will watch a commercial and within a few minutes for either forget the commercial or if we do remember, we won't remember what car com which car brand it was or, or was it even an automotive brand or was it an insurance car company or something, right? So the memorability of this campaign is, is fan absolutely fantastic. Not only people remember the, the brand that it was a Lincoln commercial, uh, they also remember, they very clearly associate McConaughey with Lincoln, and the memorability on it is great. And all the other metrics for the campaign uh, have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, as you know, we just launched the MKX with an all-new set of uh, commercials uh, with Matthew McConaughey. Between um, the, how we're positioning the brand and the new products, the average age of the buyer has been going down. So average age of the luxury industry right now is 54. Uh, we are at 58, uh, which is slightly older. But just a few years ago, we were at 67. Mm. So in less than <laughs> seven or eight years, uh, it has come down from 67 uh, down to 58. And that's been driven by all the new customers 
and the Conquest customers' vehicle like, like the MKZ and the C and the X have been bringing into our showroom. So you don't mind all the parodies of those ads that have happened, love, too, poking fun at them? Love the parodies. <laughs> love the parodies because... <laughs> Any uh, publicity is good publicity. It, Just it tell Lincoln talk. correctly. <laughs> yeah, it, it brought us into, uh, the, into the pop culture conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, was, uh, it, it showed kind of a love for the brand. Uh, and, and the parodies were not negative. So it, it was a great campaign for us. Do you need a, are you going to be back in Super Bowl? Um, I, I haven't thought that far ahead yet. But most <laughs> yeah, well, likely you better hurry not. up. Well, <laughs> yeah. The season has started. <laughs> Maybe not for the Lions. But <laughs> we are in all the football games. We're on the college football games and the NFL. Uh, because Just because of the reach uh, of those games is so, so broad. It's fantastic. And how long will you have Matthew McConaughey with the success of the campaign? Have you re-upped him for a, for a long time? We, we, uh, we haven't, quote-unquote, re-upped him because the, when we signed the contract, it was a multi-year contract. So we're still in the, in the original contract. How many years does it go? Actually, I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to ask he my advertising team. <laughs> Kumar, I'm so impressed that Ford Motor Company is calling Lincoln, not just a brand, but the Lincoln Motor Company. I'm so impressed that they appointed you as the president of that company, not just as a glorified brand manager. You're involved in so much more than what brand managers do. How is all that going? How separate can Lincoln become? And, and, and one question, uh, going back to Cadillac, Johan de Nyssen, who runs Cadillac, has said he wants General Motors to publish a separate P&L and show how Cadillac's doing. Will we ever see something like that from Ford with the Lincoln Motor Company? Well, first of all, we, we are an integral part of the Ford Motor Company. And for me, it was a personal thrill to, to be in this position, because how often do you get a chance to, to grow an iconic brand like this in the U.S. and, and to introduce it to a, a vibrant market like China? Um, and the setup is very synergistic. Um, we have our own design studio, so the, the vehicles are completely unique Lincolns. But the synergies are very, very effective. You know, the, there are parts of the vehicle that the customers don't really care whether they are shared or not. Um, a fuel sender or a fuel tank or fuel lines, if those are shared with a sister Ford vehicle, it's not something that's important uh, to deliver what the customer's needs are. And that synergy really helps us uh, in terms of efficiency. So there are shared resources in those, in those areas, uh, but then there are resources where we do need to be unique. We have our own advertising agency, which is uh, based in New York. Uh, we have our own unique marketing and sales organization. We have a very unique product development organization that delivers all these great products, but leverage uh, the Ford sister um, organizations to, to do stuff that really is, isn't and shouldn't be unique to Lincoln, uh, like the couple of examples I mentioned. So overall, that entire setup is working very, very well. In terms of publishing uh, the P&L separately, we don't have any plans to do that in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, is one way to distinguish Lincoln products to um, have rear drive cars in the future? Uh, that's a really, really interesting question. So I'm going to take a little, a little bit of time to answer this because we have studied the luxury market in great detail in, in terms of what kind of psychographics are at play, which sub-segments are within the luxury segment. So there is a segment <coughs> in, in the luxury uh, that is very much performance-oriented. Uh, these are very successful, aggressive driving kind of people. Uh, but there are several other segments within the luxury industry that are looking for something different. So uh, uh, let me give you a couple examples. A, a beautiful car can be designed in multiple ways. You know, a, a beautiful car can, be, can have a very aggressive, edgy, angular look. It's still beautiful, but it's aggressive beauty. Uh, or it can be a different kind of beauty, an elegant beauty. So I, I would say the Continental is a very elegant car, and that's our design language in terms of elegance. There are several customers, a large group of customers, who don't really care whether the car is front-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive, uh, because that's not one of their key needs. So for us, we're not designing vehicles saying we need technology A or technology B, 
we're doing research on what is it that our customers need and then picking the technologies and the features that deliver what they're what they're delivering what their needs are so coming back to the rear wheel drive elegance is a key part of our design language so if there is a particular vehicle that would require the rear wheel drive kind of proportions that need to be delivered we would certainly look at that if, if that proportion couldn't be delivered with a front wheel drive car but going in our assumption is not that we should have rear wheel drive for the sake of having rear wheel drive so a very different mindset in design right now. Study the customer, understand the customer, understand their needs, then pick technologies and platforms and features that deliver on that, even if we have to invent them. Kumar, a lot of the luxury automakers have been very active in showing autonomous concepts, Mercedes. Absolutely. Cadillac is coming with their hands-free Super Cruise. Uh, when will we see an autonomous Lincoln? And we need a quick answer. We're down to the end. <laughs> well, we only Saved have by the bell, I suppose. But <laughs> <laughs> we only have several semi-autonomous features. Semi. Semi-autonomous. Mm -hmm. We're building on. We're building on them. And uh, as a corporation, Ford Motor Company, we are working on. We are right in the game on building and designing. And we have some on the road already, the, the test autonomous vehicles. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. Great question. We're going to have to have you back for another show. Kumar Gaholtra, president of Lincoln Motor Company. Thanks so much for coming on today. Really Thank you, Jeff. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Lisa Priddle from the Detroit Free Press. Keith Naughton from Bloomberg. Great having the both of you here, too. I want to thank all of you for having me.